Secret of the Lost Empire by L.W. Yost, Chapter 1. The Snake The snake lay coiled in the center of the village clearing, its arrow-shaped head weaving slowly from side to side. John moved lively, a short distance in front of it. He kept his hands and body in continual motion in order to distract the snake's attention, so that at the right moment he could lunge in and clasp it behind the head. Sot! The snake flashed at the boy. John leapt aside, the lethal head brushing against his right hand, but not penetrating. A cry shot up from the Indians watching the duelists from their huts and from the shadows of the forest. Old Atura, chief of the Jacamas, leaned forward expectantly, his maize leaf cigarette clenched between large yellow teeth. Sut! The snake struck again, and once more John dodged its blow. The creature swayed, head back, neck arched with a delicate tautness of a spring about to release. Its small, beady eyes watched the moving boy, and its needle-like tongue darted threateningly between its fangs. Behind lay the overturned basket in which it had been imprisoned only minutes before. Slowly the snake eased itself toward the boy. John retreated in a circular pattern, his white shirt and duck pants, creating the impression of some dancing apparition in the shimmering heat. The basket, John, look out, hissed Howard from the broad circle of Indians, but the warning came too late. The boy stumbled and dropped to the earth. Seizing its opportunity, the snake dove at the sprawled form. John could do nothing but flatten himself against the ground. As the snake's fangs glanced off his boot, his uncle grabbed a tourist stick. But the old chief held him back. This is between them, he whispered. John can take care of himself. Look. From his prone position, John had seized the creature before it could recoil. Enraged, the snake darted at the boy's face. John jerked his arm sideways to divert the blow. Slowly, he eased himself up on one knee and cautiously moved into an upright position. The tense silence emanating from the circle of Jacama Indians was like the moment before an explosion. Only Atura looked confident. The duelist swayed in the hot sunlight. Somehow, John had to move his hand higher up on the writhing body. Only in that way could he stop the moving death dart, which now had too much play above his wrist. But the snake was giving him no opportunity to get a fresh grip. Sut! A long, hard jab nearly jerked the snake from John's firm gra grip. The head brushed the boy's ear, but once again failed to make lethal contact. And then, suddenly, unexpectedly, the duel was over. A great roar broke from the Indians as John took a last gamble. His left hand shot out and clutched the neck just behind the head. In the same instant, his right hand slid down the body, rendering the reptile motionless. The spectators milled around, jabbering loudly. My boy, Howard shouted, don't ever do that again or I'll... He patted his, his nephew on the shoulder. I won't, said John, believe me. Howard stroked his beard. Next time a captured snake escapes, just let me shoot him. You'll never know how close you came to... But that last word stuck in his throat. Old Atura elbowed his way through the crowd of chattering Indians. Out of my way, you baboon-eyed macaws. Let me see the snake before the boy kills it. I'm not going to kill it, said John. It wouldn't have attacked me if it hadn't been tormented and kept prisoner in the basket. I'm going to let it go. Atura shook his head sadly. He did not understand. The snake should die. Howard leaned closer to get a better look at the fangs. Let's extract the venom first, eh, John? John began running his forefinger over the head of the snake, the head that a few minutes before had been trying to kill him. Already small boys had begun to imitate the duel with strips of vine from the overhanging trees. The older boys were standing around to see if anything more was going to happen. Howard went into one of the huts and returned with a small glass vial. Holding the head, snake's head firmly, the boy pressed its fangs over the lip of the glass and began to squeeze gently. A clear fluid jetted into the container, enough to finish off a dozen men. Howard would use it later as an antidote for snake bites. John then carried the creature through the crowd and dropped it to the ground, a short distance from the jungle. Quickly, it slithered off into the deep grass. The country of the Jacamas lies in the region of the Tuki River, 
a deep black water stream that flows by way of a complicated network into the Amazon at a point some 2,500 kilometers from its mouth. It is a rich green country of thick forests and impenetrable swamps, of great trees whose vine-tangled limbs and gray-white boles are bearded with lianas. From the air, it is like an immense unbroken meadow running westward toward the headwaters of the Amazon and the jagged peaks of the Andes. Below, where the matted leaves and hanging mosses shut out the light, it is an underworld, silent and gray, broken only where a tree has been strangled by vines and died, leaving a hole in the green roof, where the sun pours in over the rotting remains. The Jacama Indians seldom venture into these dark forests, and then only to hunt deer or wild pigs. The rivers are their only means of communication with neighboring villages, and they travel them in long, narrow dugout canoes. As well as serving as highways, the rivers also provide the Jacamas with their chief sustenance, fish, and with such delicacies as turtle eggs, eels, and baby jacaras or alligators. When John emerged from his swim later that afternoon, he felt alive, refreshed, and very hungry. All he wanted now was some good food and a chat with Howard. In the center of the village, Tapiro was standing over two large iron pots, slowly mixing the contents with a long wooden label. Smells nice, said John, coming up beside her, licking his lips. Then have some, she said curtly in dialect. He scooped a portion of fish and rice stew onto a platter, broke off a large chunk of farina cake, the Indian substitute for bread, and sauntered on to find Howard at the far end of the village. The stew had cooled a little by the time John reached Howard's hut, which stood between the buttress roots of a mammoth silk and cotton tree. The boy sat on the ground with his back against one of the giant roots and proceeded to dig in. Howard was working on a canvas mounted on an ingenious bamboo easel, but stopped painting in order to help himself to some of John's farina cake. The canvas depicted a phase of life in the daily routine of the Indians. There was a boldness of color and stroke about the work that captured the rhythms of a people whose life was one of constant effort to survive. I was thinking of my father again today, John whispered suddenly and, and unexpectedly. He had finished eating and was sitting, elbows on his knees, staring vacantly at the ground. Howard paused to look at the boy. Oh? John kept his eyes fixed on the ground, saying nothing. Howard smiled faintly and, slipping his pipe between his teeth, walked over to the boy. You're bound to think of him, John, he said, patting him on the shoulder. The boy stirred. I, I was just wondering again if... Howard knelt down beside him and looked full into his face. You were wondering if, after all these years, your father might still be alive. John lowered his eyes. You still hope that he might be living with a tribe of Indians somewhere out in that godforsaken country? The boy nodded. I thought so. Howard leaned back against the tree and began to light his pipe. You think me callous, he said finally. No. My boy, I want your happiness more than anything. You know that, don't you? Grudgingly, John said, yes. Well then, why not take a few words of advice from an old friend? Accept the facts. Don't wish for fairy tales. John continued to stare at the ground. The trouble is, you're a chip off the old block. Thanks. Don't thank me. He stroked his short steel gray beard vigorously. I had the same argument with your father. I tried to convince him that his obsession with the falls of Oriana was based on a simple legend and nothing more. I tried to persuade him that his crazy dreams would bring him nothing but disappointment. And I was right. There never was a more wonderful man than your father, nor a more discontented one. The only real happiness he ever knew was with your mother when, for the first time in his life, he dispensed with dreams and lived for the present. You argued with him, yet you went on practically all his trips with him, John shook his head. Why? Besides being a very wise man, I am also a fool. The boy laughed outright. But don't forget that I enjoyed those trips into the headwater country on a day-by-day -day basis. Your dad was interested only in where the trip was leading him. Howard relit his pipe, got to his feet, and went back to his easel. He painted for a long while, saying nothing, sucking at his pipe stem. Then he stopped and pointed his brush at John. 
Don't be getting any wild ideas, he said. Remember, he was interrupted by the sound of outboard motors in the distance, as old Atura came running up to announce that two white strangers and six Indian porters were rounding the bend in the river.